Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Justin Dorenzis, and I serve as the Assistant Director of Alumni and Parent Engagement here at Moravian. And this evening, we are extremely excited to welcome Dr. Carol Trotman Carr, class of 1986 from Moravian, and our featured guest and presenter this evening. Before I introduce uh, Carol a little bit more for those of you who may not know her as some of her classmates here this evening, um, I did want to notify everyone that when you joined the meeting this evening, you had joined as a member with your microphones muted. I asked that during the presentation, um, if everyone could keep their microphones on mute, um, that would be great until the end of the presentation when we will open up the presentation for a question and answer session with Carol. For some of you um, who already have your video cameras off, that will certainly help with the buffering of this presentation. For those of you that have your video cameras on and would like to keep them on, you may certainly do that. Um, but I just wanted to let everyone know that with this meeting being recorded, it may help with the um, buffering of the, of the recorded presentation it's, itself. Dr. Carol Trutman Carr graduated, as I said, from Moravian in 1986. Upon completion of her degree at Moravian, she matriculated and pursued and attained her PhD in musicology uh, from Cornell University. And upon returning to her alma mater, she has served the college in several administrative capacities over the years, most currently serving the college in two as professor of music and as vice provost of the faculty. A recipient of the 2016 Bedigna Education Award, Cara has certainly um, shadowed an example of not only her commitment to Moravian, but more in addition, her commitment to for ensuring that our students have the successes moving forward. So without further commentary, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Carol. Thank you so much, Justin. And Chad, see, it was right, 2016. Um, so let me uh, pull up the presentation here. Okay, um, feel free, please, to ask questions using the chat function as I am speaking here. Uh, Amanda and Justin are going to monitor that and they can interrupt if there's questions along the way. There's certainly gonna be time for questions at the end. There's a lot of information in here. Uh, I'm going to be talking more than I would like to. Uh, I would love to have a little bit more of a dialogue, but there's a lot of ground to cover. When um, Brian Grigsby assumed the presidency of Moravian College in 2013, one of the things that he wanted to do was to make us a little bit more nimble for changes that were happening or, or that we knew were going to be happening um, in American higher education. There were a lot of information about uh, how people were looking at the value of uh, liberal arts education, education in general, uh, changing demographics. And, as, and then uh, as part of the strategic plan that he initiated um, in 2015, he, the, the plan included uh, that we would create at least 15 new programs between 2015 and 2020. Last week, I wrote the draft of, um, of our, our final report for a section of that strategic plan. And I'm happy to report not only did we hit 15, we actually hit by my count 37 new programs in the last four years actually, because in the first year we really couldn't do um, a whole lot of new programming. Uh, we were just laying out the strategic plan. And so I'm gonna go through those as well as talk a little bit about some of the plans that we still have, some of the programs that we're still planning uh, as we move forward. So I'll begin with, and I don't know why I drew a, apparently I drew a nice orange line across the screen, but oh well. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about study abroad. Now, some of you may have done some study abroad experiences while you're at Moravian College. Uh, for many students, their study abroad experience was not a full semester or a full year, but rather a travel course led by a faculty member where they did maybe 10 days or two weeks we feel that that's a really important experience for students to be able to, to get out of the Lehigh Valley, get out of the country in a, in a way that's um, supervised by a faculty member um, and they're earning Moravian College credit. We've been working on expanding some of those programs. As you can see here, um, we still have faculty-led travel. We've added new exchange programs in Tanzania, Osaka, Univer Universidad del País Vasco, 
Um, those are just in the last couple of, uh, last three years. The exchange programs allow a student to pay Moravian College tuition and use Moravian College financial aid, which is really, really important. They can use their state aid, their federal aid, their, their Moravian College scholarships to help pay for that program. We basically just swap a student with one of those programs. We signed on with a company called Lion Education, which offers summer programming in China at several different universities. Moravian College is the school of record, so the courses are being transcripted there. Why would we care about that? Why do they care about that? Well, Lion Education is not an institution of higher education. They are a program provider that links students with uh, faculty and they rent space in these places in China so that students can go and spend the summer in China. Perhaps not this summer, um, but they can spend the summer in China studying with an English speaking professor from an American university earning credit towards a degree in the United States. Well, Lyon is not a university or a college. They do not have accreditation. And so schools were not accepting their credits. They partnered with Moravian College. And so the court, so after reviewing the courses and the resumes of the instructors and actually sending a team to visit, we have decided to be the, pro, the uh, school of record. And so Moravian College's name is on the transcript. And now those students are able to transfer those courses to their home school. Many of the students who study in these programs are actually Chinese nationals who are going home and want to continue to earn credits. We're also looking at domestic study away programs, such as at the National Institute of American History and Democracy, which happens to be down at uh, William and Mary, one of the few schools in the United States older than Moravian College. And we've had two students who have decided to spend a semester away down there in, in Williamsburg studying American history, and then they come back um, and we're looking for more such domestic opportunities. It's, um, it's really unfortunate in this, in this COVID situation and not knowing what the post-COVID world would be like. We don't know what the travel abroad experiences will be, what the opportunities will be for anybody, including the people on this call, much less for our students. But we continue to look for opportunities because we think going and spending some time in, a, in another country, learning about those cultures, immersing yourself, is an awesome way to expand your personal horizons and get to understand um, more about the people on this wonderful planet. Co-ops, again, this is something um, that came out of the new strategic plan. It was actually the brainchild of uh, our uh, late uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs, Gordy Weil. Gordy had um, the idea that we should um, Think about doing co-ops, which is uh, cooperative education is something that you do not find at small private liberal arts colleges very often. It is something that you tend to find in large cities such as Boston, Philadelphia. Uh, it is something that you'll find at institutions that are much, much larger than Moravian College. Um, what makes an internship versus a co-op? Many of you know about internships. We've had internships for years. A co-op is sort of an internship on steroids. So for an internship and a co-op, they are similar in that in both cases, students earn credit. In both cases, students are working out in the workforce. Um, in both cases, students can earn pay if that is permitted by the company that they're working for. Um, one of the things that distinguishes our co-op program is, uh, first of all, it's not mandatory, it's optional. Uh, at some larger institutions where they have co-op programs, it is mandatory. We do allow students to count it towards graduation. There's a well-known uh, institution somewhere in Center City, big city near us, about a mile, an hour south. Um, I won't say the name of the university, but their mascot's a dragon. And um, they require students to do co-ops. It is required that they pass the co-op for graduation but the credits that they earn on the co-op do not count towards graduation. For students at Moravian College who do a co-op, those credits do count towards their graduation. They, um, and that's a, been an important distinguisher. We have run a pilot program in computer science and in management. And in fact, uh, the one of the first students to do the co-op in management did it internationally. He went out to uh, Ireland and spent an entire semester full-time in an immersive experience working for, some, for a company in Ireland so we got both the study abroad experience and that really important business experience, hands-on learning while he was there. It will be available, the co-op will be available in most programs. Now I can't say it will be available in every program because there are some fields in which you actually need to have a, a bachelor's degree or a particular licensure before you can work in that field. 
consider nursing, for example. You can't do a full-time immersive cooperative experience as a nurse until actually you've graduated in nursing and have passed the nursing licensing exam. Not to worry, nurses have lots and lots of hours of hands-on experience anyway, as they uh, do um, clinical hours every single week throughout their degree program. The pilot is done. We approved the program in the fall of 2019. It was a, uh, in December, right before we closed for Christmas. And so we'll be going into the catalog. You've probably read, if you've been paying attention in Meridian Magazine or in Income, and you've probably heard a lot about the health programs that we have been adding. And I'm going to talk about these um, uh, one at a time. Athletic training. This was our first of the health programs beyond nursing, which we've, uh, we've now celebrated uh, 20, we just graduated our 22nd class of nursing, um, not counting the classes that graduated in the 50s and 60s. Uh, nursing went away for a while. Athletic training is our first entry-level professional practice program outside of nursing. It is a graduate level program. Uh, 2020 is the last year that students can go to college to become an athletic trainer and then go right into the workforce with a bachelor's degree. And so not wanting to shift from the bachelor's degree to the uh, master's degree, we built the program immediately as a master's level program. There's a significant need for athletic trainers for a variety of reasons. They're in some ways uh, sort of mini physical therapists. They can do a lot of work with athletes to prevent injury, to recover from injury. But because of the uh, attention that uh, concussions have gotten in recent years, um, there's a, a greater need for athletic trainers than ever before. In fact, it used to be that schools could have one or two athletic trainers on staff and they would kind of rotate their way through practices. Um, and, and you always had to have someone at a game. Now you need to have someone at the practices as well. You cannot have practices in college or high school without an athletic trainer there. So there's a lot more need. Our first cohort graduated in June 2018. Um, we just graduated our third cohort. In the first two cohorts, we had 100% retention, 100% first time pass rate on the licensing exam, and 100% job placement within the first three months of graduation, which is really incredible. We are now fully accredited by Katie, which is the um, body that accredits uh, athletic training education programs. And so that was also a huge accomplishment. And I have to say, the, 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 course, the, the, the groups are small, maybe anywhere from seven to 12 people per cohort right now. We can accommodate 24. Um, we have been not only doing great things in terms of graduation rates and job placement, our students have been presenting um, their scholarship and research on a national level. We have, every single year since we started the program, we've had students win a national scholarship through Katie and the, uh, the um, National Organizations for Athletic Trainers. In fact, this year, I think, I think we had four students win scholarships this year, which was the most by any school in the country, any school in the country, including the really large state universities. And when you consider that our cohort is somewhere around 12 to 15, maybe, um, that's a pretty high percentage of students winning those scholarships. We're very, very proud of that program. We added our first doctoral program. Doctor of Athletic Training started in January 2018. There are only about four or five such programs in the entire country. Uh, this is a post-licensure program. It is online. The students have two two-week sessions where they come to campus and have a really intensive immersive experience. We won't be doing that immersive experience this summer for the cohort, but otherwise everything's online. Like I said, one of only about four or five programs in the entire country. All the other ones are at large state institutions out west. I'm so very excited that we have our first doctorate. Occupational therapy. We started a master of science in occupational therapy. It's a two-year program. Um, our first cohort will graduate next year. Um, our second cohort begins, actually began this uh, just yesterday. Um, this is a program, the accreditors for occupational therapy, they, um, they, they can't make up their mind if they want it to be um, a master's degree or a doctoral degree. Um, they keep going back and forth. We do imagine that eventually we will transition to an occupational therapy doctorate, which would be a three-year program. Again, we've been doing very, very well. We hit our entire cohort the first time we built it. That's pretty incredible because the program is not yet accredited. For athletic training, occupational therapy, you must wait until your first class graduates before you can get accreditation. So for us to fill the occupational therapy 
cohort without accreditation the very first time says a lot about the program that we're offering. Physical therapy. We are anticipating a summer 2021 start. Now I've added, I have added it here as a new program because it has been approved by the faculty. Um, it has uh, gotten approval by Middle States, our accrediting agency, as our second professional doctorate program. And that's important because once you have, when you uh, add a new credential level for Middle States, whether it's a, a, a kind of a certificate or a degree program, the first two of that type must go through the accreditation process with Middle States. And so with Middle States approving this as our second doctorate, we are now fully accredited to add as many other professional doctorates that we would like. This is different from the PhD. And so if we decide at some point to add a PhD or an EDD, we'll have to go back to Middle States again. But we're very excited about this. Um, physical therapy is uh, it's an expensive program to start. It requires a lot of faculty. It requires a lot of clinical placements. It requires a lot of special equipment. Some of you have, uh, hopefully all of you have seen pictures of the, what I like to call the West Campus. Um, that is the Moravian College St. Luke's uh, Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation Center at 1441 Shanersville Road, which is why I call it the West Campus. Um, that facility was purchased. It was the uh, racquetball club. We purchased it, gutted it, renovated it, specifically to house these graduate rehab science programs. And so we have built in the infrastructure for physical therapy. They use a lot of the same equipment as athletic training. We have hired our uh, director. We've hired the clinical education coordinator. We've hired other faculty. All of these are required by the accreditor before we even advertise the program as open for application for students. They require a 23-month lead time from the time you hire the program director until you can even get in the candidacy queue. So they're, they don't want anybody who's kind of just thinking about physical therapy. They really want people who are going to commit to it. We think those make a really nice, uh, a nice group together. Now, President Grigsby, when he came in, he came in and said, I really want athletic training, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. Uh, I went into his office one day and said, I, I think we should add speech pathology. And he said, I have given that no thought whatsoever. He said, tell me about it. And I said, well, I don't know anybody who's, uh, uh, I, I haven't personally needed speech services, but I have a number of friends whose children have. They say the marketplace is, is um, it's very, very hard to get into a, a speech pathologist. It can take months for that first appointment. Um, and it seems to me like, that you know, we, should, we should pursue this. So he said, okay, write a business case. So I did. I'm happy to say we have speech pathology. Um, and I'll take full credit for that. But um, we are the only institution in the country that has athletic training, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech pathology all under one roof, all in one department. We did this deliberately because we really feel that all of these um, disciplines are so closely related. Uh, my, many of you know my background is music. Um, I am, I've, I've been a patient in, in therapy. I'm never going to be a practitioner in therapy. I don't care what the initials are behind someone's name. I just want them to make me better, make me feel better. And so one of the things we're trying to do is to be very patient focused, be uh, very focused on the, the culture where uh, students where, well, students will be working someday and to remember that they're going to be part of a healthcare team for people. And so it's important for them to think in an interprofessional way from the beginning. Every single one of these accrediting bodies says, you all need to be thinking about being interprofessional, but none of them require very much of it. We actually are teaching classes where speech pathologists and occupational therapists and athletic trainers are in class together, learning the disciplinary boundaries for each other, learning how in a certain situation, an occupational therapist is really the best person to take care of this, whereas in a different situation, the speech pathologist is really the best person to take care of this. Learning how to talk to each other because they have different approaches to, to whatever the patient's issue is. Um, speech pathology in particular, we had um, a lot of demand for a long time in undergraduate admissions and continuing education. I mentioned how I have friends who had trouble getting uh, speech pathology services for their, for their children. Um, I've, I've learned recently that Speech pathology is for all age groups. Uh, I have an aunt who uh, two years ago had a traumatic brain injury 
and in her 80s is going through speech pathology services. She had to learn how to swallow again. That's a speech pathologist. That's not a physical therapist. This program began last summer. We just, again, on yesterday, welcomed our second cohort. This program is different from the other ones in that it starts off with full accreditation. The accrediting body, ASHA, the, uh, um, I think it's the Association of Speech and Hearing Professionals in America, they come in and they review the program before you advertise, before you bring any students in, and they will give you accreditation or not up front. And so it's a little bit unusual that way. They came, uh, I can remember distinctly the exit interview with them. It was on my birthday um, in May of 2018. And the team said, we have never done an initial candidacy visit where there is nothing to fix. We have never seen a program like this. This is the program of the future. This is the program every other school needs to model. And this is where we're going to send our students. Um, and so we are super duper excited about that speech pathology program. As I mentioned, we have nursing. We've had a, an undergraduate degree in nursing for a while. We've had a master's science in nursing for a little bit, but we, and we added a nurse practitioner track to that a little while ago. But recently we've added the adolescent family track. Um, there are different levels of different kinds of certifications for nurse practitioners. We had previously the acute care and adult gerontology, but adolescent family is really the way of the future. This is something that can sort of run the, life, the entire lifespan. And um, as there is an upcoming doctor shortage, uh, it's anticipated by 2030 that we could have a shortage of, of medical doctors, um, perhaps as many as 130,000 nationwide. And the biggest shortage will be in family and general practice. So getting nurse practitioners who have that adult family background is really, really important. Students can come and include that certification, that licensure within their master's sci uh, science in nursing if they wish, or they can come and they can take just the coursework for the nurse practitioner and they can do these postgraduate certificates. We are looking at some point to a possible transition to a doctor of nursing practice program. Now you might wonder how we're getting students ready to enter all of these graduate programs. That is, we under added an undergraduate major in health sciences. Um, it has tracks right now for athletic training, physical therapy, and occupational therapy. We are developing a speech language pathology track. Um, this is not a program for students who want to go to medical school. It's not a program for students who want to become PAs. It does not have uh, as much science as many of those students need. Um, but it does work for the allied health professions. We've got all of this swirl with all of these different graduate level health programs. And so this is something that we're thinking about. I mentioned the concussion legislation earlier. We're saying, you know, if we're, it, it, speech pathologists treat people with concussions because they might lose their ability to swallow. They might not be able to speak. So occupational therapists work with concussion. They, they help people to get back to whatever it is that they want to do with their lives. They want to play the piano. They want to be able to type again. They want to be able to cook dinner. Physical therapists also help. Maybe there's a way that we can pull all of these together and perhaps create a certificate or a center on campus that, that does concussion research and, and protocols or maybe something for chronic pain management. So there's a, a great opportunity for us to pull this together, especially in partnership with, our, uh, with St. Luke's and with Lehigh Valley Health Network. And we, we do um, work with both of those. St. Luke's, of course, is a very close partner for us, both in terms of proximity here in Bethlehem. They actually rent space from us in that sports medicine complex. Um, but we also work uh, closely with folks over at Lehigh Valley Hospital. We are blessed here in the Lehigh Valley to have two outstanding nationally recognized um, health systems that we can work with. But wait, there's more. Um, we used to have a med tech program. Some of you might remember back in the 70s and 80s, early 90s, we had a med tech program. Students could come to Moravian for, uh, I think it was four years and then do one year um, to, as an immersive, immersive experience in med tech. Uh, there was not a lot of interest in that. Students um, didn't like the five-year idea. Um, and um, there was a move for a short time to get very, very specialized with medical technology. You became an ultrasound technologist. You became a, a radiology specialist. Um, now it's kind of broadening again. 
and we signed a partnership with Hershey Medical System. So students can do four years at Moravian, uh, three years at Moravian, sorry, and then a full year out at Hershey for that med tech degree. Uh, again, getting a lot of hands-on experience. Health informatics or information, we've been talking about this. One of the things that, um, that drives a lot of insurance decisions with healthcare, but also some of the decisions that hospitals are making about what kind of care they wanna provide, what do they need? Do they need more OBGYNs? Do they need more PEDs? Do they need more heart specialists? It's getting really good information about um, the healthcare, uh, especially in the local area. And so we've been talking a lot about adding some kind of informatics program, bioinformatics, health informatics. Quite frankly, the data science is something that is just popping up everywhere. Um, if you're following the, the COVID-19, um, if you're not too tired of that already, you hear a lot of statistics that are thrown out there. There's a lot of need for people who have data backgrounds and, and data abilities. Um, so we've spent a lot of time thinking about what we want an informatics program to look like. Um, in the meantime, we did add a data science track just this year to our, uh, it's a track within computer science. It, it removes a little bit of the computer science kind of hardware software things and adds a little bit more on the math side. We added an informatics minor two years ago. The first courses in that uh, ran in the 2018-2019 school year. So really getting, getting undergraduate students um, in on that the statistics and understanding how to analyze statistics. Frankly, everybody could use more statistics. Even me as a musician uh, could use more st statistics. Um, and there's a lot of directions that people can go. Yes, it's driven in, in many ways by what we're looking at in healthcare, but there's a lot of need for business statistics. You can go into, uh, there's a huge industry for sports statistics, um, higher education statistics. Frankly, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Okay, now that I did cover their health programs, some undergraduate, some graduate. Here I'm gonna talk about other, other new programs and these are really focused on undergraduate. These are programs that have been approved and have in most cases started. And I'll just go through them quickly. We added a minor in theater, still don't have a major in theater, but we really don't have the facilities. Um, minor in dance. Um, dance moved with Don Ketterman's retirement a few years ago. Um, dance moved from physical education to music. For many of you, you might recall, um, those of you who especially who were there at the same time that I was in the 80s, uh, there used to be a phys ed requirement. We had to take eight phys ed courses to graduate. Um, these kids have it so easy. They have no phys ed requirement anymore um, and it's in order to graduate. And so um, the phys physical education department no longer really exists. Uh, we still have athletics. We still have recreational activities. And so dance moved to music. Music welcomed them with open arms and, uh, and has actually done great things in terms of building a curriculum there and uh, raising awareness. And so the dance program now belongs to music and we have an official minor in dance. Just this May, just three weeks ago, we approved a minor, uh, that actually should be a certificate in indigenous studies. Um, why not a minor? A minor is five classes, a certificate's only four. And so students can get it done a little bit more quickly. Um, and so that's helpful. Um, we have also approved this spring, a minor in anthropology. Uh, we have, now two full-time uh, tenure track, one is tenured, one's tenure track, anthropologists on our staff. Um, I don't know, I think Kurt Keim, for those of you who remember Kurt Keim, who became a vice president um, and dean, um, had some training in anthropology, but he was also an historian. These are actually two full-time uh, anthropologists aligned with the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Um, and we've had students who have been designing their own minor in anthropology. They really like this idea of, of studying humans and the human condition. So um, following what they were working on together, we were able to develop a minor. The math department reorganized its major and into three clear tracks, an applied math track, which again is heavy on the statistics, pure math track, which helps students, especially who are going into uh, teacher certification, and an actuarial track, again, there's a lot, been a lot of student interest in an actuarial science major. We don't need the science major, but they do need really strong math skills. And so the actuarial track helps them with that. Now this might seem, renaming a track might not seem like a new program, but I have to tell you, it has a huge impact for us. For those of you who are here in the, in the 70s and the early 80s, Moravian College had a criminal justice major. 
over time, uh, based on different directions that the college was going, there was a little bit of a feeling that we've got nothing against people going into criminal justice, but it feels a little bit like we're preparing police officers and people who work in juvenile detention. We really want to prepare lawyers. Um, and so they um, changed the name a little bit when we were in pursuit of prestige. That was part of a initiatives in the strategic plan in the late 90s and early 2000s. They changed the name to Law and Society. Um, didn't really change the courses, didn't change the offerings. We have many wonderful graduates from that, from the previous program who are serving our society well. Um, uh, Judge um, Emil Giordano, uh, John Morganelli, for example. Uh, I can name uh, Candy, Candy Barr Heimbach. Uh, I can name many other uh, people who came to Moravian College study political science or sociology, went on to criminal justice um, in, the, in the law field. Well, what happened was students started to say, you don't have criminal justice. I said, yeah, yeah, we call it law and society. Well, if it couldn't, they couldn't see it in the catalog, they didn't believe it. And so the department has gone back to naming its track instead of law and society or law, crime and society, criminal justice and law. And this is really huge for us in the marketplace because we were losing students just because of the name, way the track was named. Um, and, uh, and so we, uh, we've gone back to calling it what it is um, and hoping that it serves the needs of those students. We added a new degree program in art. Um, this is a, a Bachelor of Fine Arts and the art department is really happy to be able to offer this. They've had really an excellent art department for a long time. Art has a huge historic role at Moravian College going back, it's a, it's a huge part of, frankly, Moravian culture, going back to the very, very, very beginning of the settlement here in Bethlehem. Music and art uh, have been there since the beginning. Um, music has the two tracks, the Bachelor of Arts and then the Bachelor of Music, and uh, art has now a Bachelor of Arts in Art, as well as a BFA, the Bachelor of Fine Arts. Uh, it allows students who are interested in studio art, art history, graphic and interactive design, and photography to do even more in-depth upper level work in their area of choice. Uh, first graduates graduated last year. Um, they were actually already enrolled at Moravian College and took advantage of the fact that we added that degree program. So I think we had four last year. I think we had four this year. Um, this next class that's starting this fall will be the first class that was actually recruited under the BFA. Special education uh, and early childhood education, that's what ECE is. We, uh, the state of Pennsylvania in 2013, redid the certification tracks so that we no longer had elementary and secondary, but they had what was called early childhood education and the secondary stayed the same. Early childhood education changed under the Rendell administration um, when he was governor of Pennsylvania um, to try and include a little bit more of the early childhood, the sort of pre-kindergarten uh, training to give a little bit more professionalization to the people who had, were choosing to work in childcare, daycare kind of situations. The certification, strictly speaking, under Pennsylvania law uh, is described as being prenatal to grade four. I have been at this for seven years now, and I cannot figure out how they're doing the prenatal natal education because it's not of the mother, it's of the child in the womb, but that's how the certification standards are written. Um, and so if students who want to do um, early childhood, or elementary, they're choosing the early childhood, they also separated out middle level so that we could have people who specialized in grades four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, it takes a special kind of person to teach middle school. I did it for two years and I will say I am not that person. There's a special place in heaven for middle school teachers. Um, but the middle school certification um, can spend a lot of time highlighting those particular psychological and social and emotional needs of the middle schoolers. Unfortunately, Pennsylvania schools aren't divided in grades four through eight. They go kindergarten through five normally, and then six, seven, eight, and then nine through 12. So the middle level is well intended, but it doesn't really uh, fit the needs of the schools and the principals I talked to, um, not big fans because of um, the limitations for them shifting it around. But anyway, early childhood, um, every single one of these certification programs, early childhood, middle level, secondary, the state has added in each of them, more emphasis on English language learners and more emphasis on students with special needs. Special education is in the state of Pennsylvania, a certification that you cannot get by itself. You must have another certification area. And what Moravian did up until recently was students could get 
early childhood or elementary education certification, and then they could come back to get the special education certification as an add-on. We had some students who really wanted to put them together. Knowing we had the courses, they started self-designing through the Academic Standards Committee, a major that included both the certification requirements for early childhood and for special education and graduating in four years with both. We had 25 students who did this, and that was enough to say to us, yeah, we have a need here and an interest. And so we actually took what they had been working on through the Academic Standards Committee, standardized it, and now it is a formal major in our program that students can choose from the beginning. In 2013, we added, I think it was 2013, we added a public health program. And it's kind of unusual because most schools that have public health are not liberal arts schools. They tend to be state schools. Um, and most schools that have public health added it before nursing. We added it after nursing. Uh, originally, we added it as in a partnership with East Stroudsburg University. They had a um, rented space downtown Bethlehem within walking distance of Moravian College. They were looking to fill seats in their public health program. We needed a place to send students when they were not succeeding in nursing. And so our public health program really kind of started out as a place where students could go when they weren't succeeding in another major. But public health is a legitimate area of, of discourse and study in and of itself. And as, and as I said, it often pre precedes nursing study. They're very, very closely connected. So the people who are in nursing um, are working on treating the illness and treating the disease and treating the, uh, the conditions. And public health are, are often working on, um, on health education. How do you prevent illness in the first place? How do you advocate for people who don't have um, good health insurance, who don't know how to get health care? Um, they, they work on, on policy and, and they study how disease uh, spreads through populations. This is I mean, COVID-19 is a nightmare for many of us, but it's a public health professional's dream scenario. I used to say that the, the best thing that ever happened to public health was Ebola. Um, I think I have to change the, the metaphor there. Um, so we had this program that we added in 2013 with East Stroudsburg um, that we started at the, at the re request of President um, Chris Tomford. He said, let's, let's not be afraid of people in our neighborhood. Let's partner with them. A few months later, he, he uh, left and uh, Brian Grigsby came in and Brian said, we're not partnering with them. We can do our own and we can do it better. And I think we do. We've hired a, a, a superstar a director of public health. Um, as I said, they're closely aligned with nursing and they are in fact part of our nursing school. He came in and he has revised the program and now students can do a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science with different courses that go different ways. Most of the people who go into the Bachelor of Science are interested in studying more about epidemiology and uh, how health spreads through a community how, or how um, illness spreads through a community. They tend to be more on the scientific side. Um, both sides work on health education. The people who are interested in Bachelor of Arts tend to be more interested in getting into healthcare management, but there's a lot of overlap and a lot of movement back and forth and, and they, do, they do a wonderful job. Our public health Students were very, very involved this past fall when we had a mumps outbreak on campus. They worked a lot on um, uh, educational materials to, to post around campus, especially um, and, and in the dorms and in other areas of high traffic for students. The English major got rid of its journalism track a long time ago, and they said part of that was um, uh, just the way the field of journalism has changed. And you can imagine that uh, uh, if you think about how few um, the, the, how many newspapers have closed, how many people get their, their news now on, uh, on the internet. But they did have students who were interested in all kinds of different writing, including journalism, including creative writing. So they added a special, what they call a certification. It's an add-on to the English major, but they take, these students take additional courses in writing in order to get a little bit more concentration in writing. That includes creative writing, uh, creative nonfiction, poetry writing, uh, digital literacies, all kinds of all kinds of ways that we think of writing, and in fact, they've expanded their definition. I think of, of writing and, and literacy and that kind of literacy. The religion department changed its name officially from religion to global religions, and they reorganized their major. They feel that the, this is more representative of what they actually present to students. It's it is a program that students can go into who are interested in theological studies, but that is not its primary intent. Most of what they do studies religion more as a, um, 
as an aspect of culture, um, in understanding diversity, um, and in understanding religion, sort of uh, the literature of religion and the history of religion. Um, and so I think they're, they're very happy with the direction that's gone. We have added four plus one Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor MBA programs. And it started by allowing students who were in management or accounting to start to take some graduate level MBA courses in their junior year. And it's pretty tricky the way you have to organize this in terms of meeting Pennsylvania state regulations as well as federal financial aid regulations, but we did work it out. And so instead of spending four years on a bachelor's degree and then two years on a master's degree, students can finish the bachelor's degree in four and they're already part way to their master's degree. And then they can do one more year to finish their master of business administration. It really cuts down on the cost for them and the time to the degree. It started out with the natural alignment of business majors and graduate business, but we have been doing a lot of emphasis recently on combining the MBA with art and music because there uh, is a lot of interest among our students in getting into some kind of arts management and nonprofit management. And so it is a program that can be pursued in almost any program um, in the college with a few exceptions. And that would be programs that have a lot of requirements leading to some kind of professional licensure like nursing, like education where they don't have a lot of room for electives. A good combination um, for nursing and for education. I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but there are some showstoppers there in terms of just being able to pull it off. Law school agreements. We have actually signed two agreements with law schools where, where Meridian College students can get either early admission or um, early assurance. Uh, Widener Law School, where, where the director of Widener, Delaware, is actually a Meridian College graduate, um, and Rutgers. And in both cases, um, they're offering Moravian College students different things. At Widener, they're offering Moravian College students a pretty substantial scholarship if they enroll at Widener upon completing their degree here at Moravian. Rutgers allows students, um, Moravian students, to enroll at the state rate, even if they are not New Jersey residents as part of this uh, agreement. And that's, uh, as you can imagine, that's going to save the students a lot, a lot of money. Um, and we, our students can actually enroll at, in the Rutgers Law School after their third year at Moravian College, if they meet the admissions requirements. And so we actually had a student this year in the graduating class of 2020 who did three years at Moravian College in political science. She was a, a really outstanding student, um, well over 3.8 GPA. She did her entire major and all of her general education requirements in three years. Her senior year was all electives. All of those electives were fulfilled by courses that she took in law school. I need a sip of water here. Okay, so more adult and graduate programs. Again, these are things that have already been added. Master of Science in Predictive Analytics, again, big data, big, uh, very important. Over at the seminary, our friends at the seminary just across the street, we've been working very hard to pull the seminary and the college together where we can um, under one Moravian institutional umbrella. They have added a Master of Arts in Chaplaincy and a Master of Arts in Formation and Ministry. Um, that second one was, is uh, very recent. That was just added this spring. We added a Master of Fine Arts in Performance Creation. This is actually a really interesting program. It is not taught on our campus at all. It is uh, a good example of how we can partner with our community, with our community partners. In this case, Touchstone Theater. The, um, we have a faculty member here in theater who is the liaison there and he teaches in the program and he coordinates back and forth to make sure that the uh, courses that are being taught meet with our standards. Um, the course, all of the courses and all the faculty were approved at Moravian College, uh, went through our normal appro uh, approval process, but because the course, the program is not taught at all at Moravian College, we had to go through a special approval with our accreditors, middle states, and we have actually added Touchstone Theater as an additional location officially where Moravian College education takes place. Small program, it's only intended for a small group, maybe maybe six or eight total, um, because it's extremely intensive and extremely hands-on. Um, there's sort of a, it's almost built around an internship program that Touchstone has. Another very recent program just approved in, in May, and again, an example of working with a community partner, the Intermediate Unit 20, which serves Northampton County, came to a member of our faculty and said, hey, we, uh, we've got a bunch of people who were, are working for us in human resources. They came up through education. 
they were teachers or teachers aides, they, they moved up through the ranks, they eventually got out, got into administration, they have no background in administration. Uh, we need to provide them with education and training. How can you help us? And so we created a human resources graduate certificate with the IU20. Um, we've already heard from a couple of other immediate, intermediate units in the state that are interested um, in expanding this for them as well. So it's four courses that they will take. They all have their bachelor's degrees already. And after these four courses, they'll have this certificate in human resources. Pathways is the name of a program that we created that provides adult learners different pathways to a baccalaureate degree for students who don't, do not have one. One of the problems that we've had um, is trying to figure out ways to expedite the coursework for adult learners. Um, there was a time 45 years ago when Moravian College was the number one game in terms of adult degree completion in Lehigh Valley. We led the way, we started that. Um, over the years, as you can imagine, that market has gotten very flooded. The Sales has a program, Muhlenberg has a program, Lehigh has some coursework, Cedar Crest has a program, um, Rosemont, Albright, Alvernia have all moved into the area. Online has changed everything. And so the, uh, many students have lots and lots and lots of options, but they often want to come to Moravian. So Pathways was a new program that we created specifically for the adult learner so that if they had, um, if they wanted to come here and complete their degree, they could um, enroll in this program called um, Pathways they would get a major in integrative studies, which actually draws a lot on their um, general education courses. And it's, it's a lot of courses that we see to be kind of core competencies and skills and knowledge, a part of liberal education. And then rather than trying to figure out how to do a full major, which is tricky for adult learners, they often don't have the coursework available at night, they do a concentration in one of the areas I've, I've listed here, history, design, business, philosophy, or they can self-design. Um, Ariel, I see you have a question. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. I do have an answer for you. Um, and so uh, they can self-design these programs and it allows them to transfer in coursework. It allows them to use uh, standardized testing um, to help out um, in earning credits. Um, and, and because these are gen built largely on general education courses, we know that the courses are going to be available um, on a regular basis throughout the year. We were also approved recently by middle states for post-secondary certificates. You recall that I said our first two credentials of any kind have to go through middle states. Post-secondary certificates are um, fall into two categories. In this case, we're talking those that are 30 credits or less, and you must be a high school graduate, but that's the only real requirement. And so we these, these concentration areas for pathways, history, design, business, et cetera, each of those got approved by middle states, well, two of them got approved by middle states as a standalone certificate. So maybe someone is in the workforce and they say, you know, if I could just get 28 more credits or 30 more credits, I'd, I'd get a pay bump. I don't even need the whole degree. I just need something. But by organizing these as, um, as a certificate, as a standalone program, students can actually use federal, finan federal and state financial aid to enroll in them. If they're not organized as a program, they can't. And so Middle States um, allows us to organize these post-secondary certificates. Again, we're now approved at that, core, at that level, and so we can do these certificates in any areas that we choose. Uh, I mentioned the good combination between business and nursing. We have just approved a dual degree for an MBA and an MSN, the Master of Science in Nursing and the MBA together. Moravian College, I believe it was two or three years ago, changed a policy that allows graduate students at the college within the scope of accreditation and with the permission of the program director to count up to 50% of one graduate degree from Moravian College towards another graduate degree. Now, why do I say within the scope of accreditation? Because if you're pursuing an athletic training degree, you can't use Master of Science and Nursing program courses in that you must only use the Master of Science in Athletic Training courses by definition by the accreditors. However, there are courses in leadership and in finance and in business that you can take as an elective within the Master of Science and Nursing program, which happen to also count for the MBA. And so those two programs work together and said, you know, there's a lot of reason why someone who's looking at their master's in nursing 
might want to build um, might want to build up more of those MBA competencies, especially if they're thinking about getting out of the nursing on the floor and want to move into the administration. So they they led the way for a dual degree master science in nursing with the, the MBA, followed very shortly for the same reason with our doctor of athletic training and master of science, uh, that actually should be an MBA, I need to fix that. Um, that uh, master of science in nursing, uh, excuse me, the doctor of athletic training with the MBA. A lot of reason why we want that, those, that business acumen and those skills to go along with someone who's working their way up the professional um, hierarchy as an athletic trainer. One of the things that will help um, our adult learners, as well as our initiatives to serve veterans and active military, is that we have now approved officially that we can accept ACE credits. ACE credits are uh, non-traditional coursework, including all kinds of workshops and certifications and trainings that have been approved by the American Council on Education. Um, there are literally tens of thousands of such accreditations and uh, credits. We're not going to accept all of them. So if a, if a student comes to us and said, hey, I got an ACE certification in dog grooming, like that's awesome, terrific. You know, you can, my dog could use some grooming, but that's not a credit credential that aligns with the mission and offerings of Moravian College, so we can't offer you credit. Someone might come to us with, as they did, a certification about Cisco security. We have a computer science program, and so there's definitely a place for that in our curriculum. And so that student was able to earn credit based on the ACE credits um, and counted that towards his degree. Why do I mention that this is particularly important for our military? Because the Joint Services Transcript, which is the JST, the Joint Services Transcript comes with ACE credits. And so as we bring more military and veterans to campus, they will all come with a JST and we can say, okay, you took this course in leadership, you took this course in this kind of history, you took this kind of course, we can give you credit for your military experience based on that. Again, not everything, jet engine repair, terrific skill, doesn't align with our curriculum, we can't give you credit. Here's something else that I'm particularly proud of, is PLA is prior learning assessment. Again, a perfect initiative for adults, although we've had a few undergraduates pursue this as well. A prior learning assessment is sometimes mistakenly advertised as get credit for what you, for your experience. It's not credit for experience. It is credit for, you, for what you learned through that experience. That's why the learning is important. We all have experiences um, in our lives that we'd like to get credit for, but if you cannot articulate what you learned, and if that learning is not college level, and that college level learning does not align with our curriculum, I can't give you credit. So what happens here? We have students, we've had uh, six students this spring who earned credit through prior learning assessment. They start by providing their resume. They take the resume, they turn it into a narrative um, autobiography. As they turn it into the narrative autobiography, they talk about the jobs and the volunteer experiences and educational experiences they've had, and they start to flesh it out to say, what did you learn in this process? So you were a bank manager. What did you learn? You learned how to evaluate people. You learned how to do corrective action. You learned about benefits. You learn, okay, start to write all of those out. How do those things, can you provide us any certificates? Can you provide us with workshops? Can you, what can you provide us as, as evidence about how well you did with this? And then we have a subject matter expert look at it and say, yes, this looks like college level learning or no, it doesn't look like college level learning. If it looks like college level learning, does it look like anything that we might allow in our curriculum as a transfer course or that we offer? If so, work with me to show me what you, earn, what you learned and then I can give you credit. As I said, we've had six, or six students. I just got a notice of a seventh student now going through this process. Very exciting and it is a game changer and it again is something that you don't find at small private liberal arts colleges. Very common at community colleges. Potential new programs. Ariel, here is where I'm gonna to get to, to your question. These are programs that we've been talking about in a different way, in a very variety of different ways. Did, did all this other stuff on, um, on health professions? What about nutrition major? What about a nutrition minor? A minor at least, we could probably put together pretty quickly. Um, and that would go really well with nursing, with public health. Frankly, someone who's a, who's a business student might want a nursing minor, a music student, an art student, they might just be interested in it. We've drafted a communications major, which looks like it will be an interdepartmental major. So we'll partner um, half of a major in communications with half of a major in whatever else the students choose, communications and art, communications and biology, communications and management, whatever they want. 
looking at an Arabic studies minor, we have a lot of students, we, we do offer Arabic, in fact, um, we offer more uh, courses and we offer more seats in Arabic than any other school in Elvaic, uh, in our consortium. We have students who are uh, interested in, in that because, uh, if, if you don't know this, Lehigh Valley has a huge uh, Middle Eastern population, in particular um, from uh, Syrian backgrounds. My neighbor just out the way is, is actually um, of Syrian descent. Um, we also have over 100 students from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, we don't have enough courses to do a full minor in the language, but we do have students who want to combine it with cultural studies and do an Arabic studies minor, so we're looking at that. We're looking at additional areas to expand adult degree completion, maybe like a social science research and analytics, perhaps professional writing, um, occupational therapy assistant, P physical therapy assistant, uh, been in conversations off and on with L3C for that. Um, the, they do an awesome job at preparing OTAs and PTAs. But that's sort of a, while well, that's a really, really important job, if you're going through physical therapy, eventually they're gonna turn it over to the PTA and you want a really good PTA, they can't go anywhere beyond that without a bachelor's degree. So we're looking at ways that the students could go through that pathways program, perhaps use that associate's degree from L3C where they're working as an occupational therapy assistant, work in our online degree completion, get that bachelor's degree. And now if they wanna get, go into an occupational therapy program and actually get that licensure as an occupational therapist in a master's degree, they'll have that opportunity. I talked to you before about the um, um, early childhood special education program. We have drafted a similar program that would be early childhood with ESL. Uh, we are actually looking at an ESL program by itself. This would be a pre-college program for international students who want to come to the Lehigh Valley to study, but who do not, whose English skills are not good enough. Uh, Northampton Community College has an outstanding program, particularly for students who come in with no English. We're not interested in students who have no English for this program. We're talking about students who come in at sort of intermediate level, um, but Northampton can only take so many, and we'd really like to get these students on our campus so that they can uh, come to love the campus that we do and maybe enroll with us on, in a graduate program. Looking at perhaps a global studies program, um, master music and conducting, this is something the music department has been talking about. There is a master of si music and conducting at another um, Lehigh Valley, uh, Pennsylvania school, I should say, and it's done online and the music department was kind of intrigued by that. And they, uh, they have several people, they have Neil Wetzel from jazz, Paul Zirkel and choral, um, Carl Hess on instrumental, um, Carol Luddy, who's got a long instrumental background. They, really almost everyone in the music department has conducting background of some sort. So they feel that they really have the staff to do that if they want. Um, fairly high demand in the local area for master music education. There is no master music education outside of Philadelphia. Um, even going up towards Scranton. Um, and so we have so many loyal music grads in all of the school districts around here. Bethlehem, Salisbury, Southern Lehigh, Parkland, East Penn, um, and uh, Easton. And so uh, we're looking at, um, could we maybe do a, a music education program um, for them? I mentioned that we are approved for the professional um, doctoral programs. Uh, we are not approved for scholarly doctoral programs, but we are looking at a PhD in rehabilitation sciences. Why would we do that? Um, the programs in um, nursing, athletic training, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech language pathology, all of the accreditors require a certain percentage of your faculty to have a doctorate. And in some of them, athletic training, um, and I'd say physical therapy in particular, they require a certain number of people to have scholarly doctorates. So even if they have a doctor of athletic training um, or they have a PsyD or they have the, the DPT, a certain percentage have to also have either an EDD or a PhD. Um, so we were thinking if we could do this as an um, interprofessional online program where we can, again, mix up people from different disciplines so they're talking to each other across disciplinary boundaries and do it online, which would work with their schedules, that would be the ideal way to do it. Of course, we have a very strong history in education, so we're looking, should we do an EDD? We have our students come to us all the time, our graduates, and they say, yeah, I know I can go to Lehigh. I don't want to go to Lehigh. I want to come to Moravian. When are you going to add one? So we'll see. Our president is really hot on adding a physician's assistant program. There's a very strong program at DeSales but there's also very high demand in the marketplace. Remember I mentioned the shortage, the upcoming expected shortage 
of medical doctors, the physician's assistants, along with the nurse practitioners can help to fill that gap. And we've actually done some exploration on a PsyD program. This would be for uh, people to get their doctorate of psychology and work as professional psychologists and counselors. They wouldn't be non-prescribing professionals. Um, that requires the, ma the medical degree or the NP or the PA, um, but there's a very high need for additional people who can help with the healthcare crisis in the country. Uh, again, here in the Lehigh Valley, it can take months sometimes to get into a, a professional who can, who can counsel you. <sighs> okay, partnerships. I talked a little bit about some of the partnerships that we've already been working on. Talked about the IU20, you see that's there. We have started dual enrollment actually in several local high schools. Um, we have allowed students to come to our campus for, uh, for courses before, but some of those students don't have the ability to get to our campus. Their schedules don't allow it, they don't drive, they don't have a car. And so we um, now allow courses offered at Salisbury Township High School to get Meridian College credit. RCCS is uh, Roberto Clemente Charter School. I will tell you, this is a, this is a charter school in Allentown, Pennsylvania, almost, um, I, I shouldn't say almost, 100% of their students are on either free or subsidized lunch um, through the federal government. So it tells you a lot about that population, but they have a lot of students who want to try to do more, who want to try to achieve high, who have college aspirations. Um, RCCS came to us, their um, the director of curriculum, I think that's her name, her daughter graduated from Moravian. She reached out to us, she said, we had a dual enrollment program, the school we were working with pulled out. We reached out to, I won't name the school, but it's a, might, it might be the flagship college in, the, in Pennsylvania. And, um, and they said, yeah, we'll come and do it, but we're gonna charge $600 a, a student. And they said, you know, our, our, our students can't do that. So how can you help us? And so we worked with them and we um, worked on a special uh, pricing detail for them, um, a special pricing agreement. And they were just thrilled. They're so thrilled to be able to get um, college credit while they're over there at uh, Roberto Clemente. And Northwestern Lehigh is, is uh, we're almost ready to um, finalize an agreement with them um, again. Um, the, you know, the alumni network is really, really important because the person who reached out to me from there is a, is a Moravian graduate who I sang in the choir with um, when, way back when. Um, business partners, we, we are reaching out and saying, you know, what, what, what do our local businesses need? Uh, if Crayola has a whole bunch of people on the, you know, working third shift, most of whom have only um, high school diplomas, but they really would like a more educated workforce. What can we do for them? What can we do for Bebron? What can we do for Air Products, for all these places? Um, and so we actually uh, took a faculty member who, who is particularly adept at work at these partnerships and who has, she's the one who came up with the IU20 uh, plan. And we've appointed her as the Assistant Vice President for Partnerships, it's Katie Desiderio. She's still teaching for us in our business programs, but, uh, but a part of her responsibilities now are to reach out to these companies, find out what they need, how can Moravian become their preferred educational provider. Student success. Um, we have done a lot to try and work on improving student success, student outcomes. We definitely want more students retained. We want more students to graduate. Retention is super duper important. Um, you hear a lot about the student loan crisis. Well, that was before we had a pandemic, but you've heard a lot about the student loan crisis. Um, what you don't hear in the student loan crisis is that there's two groups of students who tend not to pay off um, their student loan debt in large numbers. One group is people who went to medical school, took out huge loans, declared bankruptcy, and then got jobs as doctors. The other group is students who leave college with under $10,000 worth of debt after their first year college or second year college. They don't have the means to pay off the debt because they didn't finish college and they walked away without a credential. And that we feel, um, if we're going to admit a student, we're admitting them with the expect, expectation that they are able to graduate with the right support. Um, and so we've put together a whole host of student success activities, procedures, policies, um, personnel. We um, appointed a director of student success and then, appointed, then um, pr um, promoted him to dean. Um, fleshed out a team for him. Um, we have a director of academic advising and academic support. 
We've separated out accessibility services because sometimes when, very often students who have a disability and need accommodations also need academic counseling, but that doesn't always allow space for the people who don't have need accommodations to get just the academic counseling. So we separated those out a little bit. We have a tutoring coordinator. We actually uh, added that person, I think four or five years ago. Um, we've had several people in that position, but um, that was a new position, someone who's really focused on training the tutors, uh, making sure we're always providing the tutors that the students need, professionalizing the tutoring program. We have a program coordinator who helps keep everything together. We added a health professions advisor. This is a professional advisor who has background in um, helping students who want to go to dental school, medical school, basically anything except nursing. Nursing kind of takes care of itself. Um, you go to um, college to become a nurse and, and then you, you, if you graduate and pass a license exam, you, you become a nurse. But the other ones usually require an advanced degree. Momentum, which is up at the top there, is special software that helps us to actually figure out who our students are at risk. It allows faculty to uh, post alerts if they're concerned about a student. It allows, allows faculty to po post praise for about a student and it keeps everything in one central location rather than a whole bunch of post-it notes on people's desks or a variety of emails. Phi Eta Sigma and Alpha Alpha Alpha. So the picture uh, that you can see, the long picture at the top in Central Moravian Church, actually the person at the podium there, you can't see him very well, but that is our D Dean of Student Success. Um, this was the picture at the um, re-chaptering of Phi Eta Sigma. Phi Eta Sigma is an honor society for first year college students. And we had a chapter for about 10 years and then it kind of just went away. We, we just didn't do anything with it. Well, student success is not just about finding the problem spots and trying to intervene. It's also about making sure that you're doing enough to recognize when students are doing well. You know, if, if we're retaining 75 or 78 or 80 percent of our students, we're doing more right than not. So what are those things that we're doing right? What do we do more of? What we did here is we rechaptered, rechartered the Phi Eta Sigma chapter. We were going to do it in um, Prosser Auditorium and then we outgrew that. And we were gonna do it in Foy Concert Hall and we outgrew that. We moved it to Central Moravian Church. The gentleman, you can't see him, but he's the gentleman who's sitting um, in the middle chair in the back was the vice president of the national organization. He flew out here from Indiana for the rechartering of our honor society. He said it was the largest rechartering he had ever seen. He actually stood up with his camera, he took a picture, he sent it back to his team because we inducted everybody who was currently enrolled who would have qualified had the society existed when they were freshmen. And so we had over 300 students, uh, might've been, might been even more than 500 students plus their families coming into Central Moravian Church for that rechartering um of that honor society and again to you know tell students you know good job keep it up when i was investigating how to bring back phi Eta sigma i was thinking about firsts and it occurred to me that there had been a lot of attention in the news recently about first generation college students and a lot of it was bad uh, first generation college students uh, are economically disadvantaged um, that's true about some, it's not true about all of them. First generation college students are, are not as academically well prepared as, as those coming from families that went to college. That's true about some, that's not true about all of them. First generation college students are very, very needy. All college students are needy right now. Um, so I started thinking about first and, and I started looking and I, I discovered that, you know, Moravian College, we've had a lot of first generation college students. I was a first generation college student. Um, and I went on and got a PhD from an Ivy League institution. And I was kind of getting a little bit annoyed at this, uh, all this bad press about first gens. And I looked around and I discovered there was an honor society for almost everything, but there was no honor society for first generation college students. So I went to the president and I said, I think we should start one. And he said, I agree. And so we have, you can see up there on the right hand picture, um, that is at our opening um of the very first ceremony those are two of our officers there that's me handing a certificate to dr black from our english department we induct faculty and staff as well so that students can see people um, that they work with every single day who were first gens and who have made it um, the logo which you see in the on the lower right hand side alpha 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 
uh, was designed by a Moravian College art student. Um, so established, as you can see, in 2018. Why Alpha, Alpha, Alpha? Because we're first, so we come first alphabetically then in all the honor societies. The star is important. We chose Moravian College kind of branding. We used blue, we used blue and gray for our branding. We put the star in the middle. I wrote this whole thing about how you're the star in the center of your family's life, but we were drawing on the Moravian star. And um, just have to show you, there we are. There's the signage that shows we are the national headquarters here at Moravian College that is outside Monocacy Hall. Um, so very, very happy and proud about that. How have we been doing all this stuff? As you can imagine, all these initiatives can be really exhausting and you can't just ask people to do more all of the time. So you can see, since, the, since Brian got here, look at the growth in our faculty. Um, and that we've also had some growth in administration, but not as, not as rapidly as we've grown the faculty. And I think, I can take another drink because we're at the end. I wanted to just see if there's any last minute questions, you guys can throw them quick in the chat. If not, we're gonna wrap up tonight. I know we've been on for, for quite a while and I wanna thank Carol uh, for all of her time. If anyone has additional questions or things that come up after uh, we end this call, you can feel free to email them to myself or to Justin. We can always get them to Carol if we uh, need some answers that we don't have. Uh, we're more than welcome to get those answers for you. Um, so I'm not seeing anything else pop up here. Um, so I, like I think uh, uh, this was this was great to in, in engage uh, people. Uh, I I don't remember seeing something like this uh, before, but we used to get this type of information in a magazine. I don't you don't always get the magazine as often, or you don't get to read it. And this was great. I I and I love hearing about this. I remember. Well, when I was a student, we were arguing, uh, uh, the board was arguing whether or not to move to 1,300 students from 1,200 or, you know, and it was a great debate uh, in that, uh, that, that two hours or something. So I think it's, I think it's wonderful, the uh, expanding the footprint's wonderful. Um, and it sounds like you're doing it very methodically, which uh, we, I couldn't be more proud to be a, a, a hound. So thank you. And it's great seeing you always, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to see you, Chad. And and I'm sorry I don't I'm sorry I don't recognize all of you from previous encounters, but it's good to see so many uh, names and faces that I do recognize. I appreciate that. Carol, I've been to Iceland three times. When you're ready to go to Iceland, let me know. I'd love to go back. Oh, terrific! Sounds great. <laughs> Not this summer, I think. <laughs> yeah. Just so you all know, you'll be getting an email uh, tomorrow from Justin with a. a attachment to a feedback survey. If you all could just take a minute to kind of give us a little bit of feedback on how you thought tonight went. If there's topics or other ideas that you'd like to learn about, you can put them in there as well and we can see if we can set some more of these up. Uh, we typically do our return and learns on campus, but because of the situation and not being able to be together, we decided to switch to this virtual route and I think it worked especially for some of our alums who might not be able to come back to campus on a normal basis. Um, some of our farther alums, I know we got, I think two of you on from Florida right now at least. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting. Um, so we will definitely look into kind of doing this more. Um, all of our previous return and learns are recorded and posted on the alumni website. So feel free to look on there and find those. And also be on the lookout, Justin and I have started a new podcast. It's called Houndcast. That is also up on the website, and those are posted on the first and third Wednesday of each month. So be sure to look out for those. They are different topics, uh, a lot of faculty and staff on there right now, um, and some really neat things. So look out for those as well. Yeah, and I just want to thank you all for hanging in. I know that was a lot of information to take in. That was a lot of talking, but, but thanks for hanging in there. I appreciate it. Thank you, Carol. Okay, thank you. Thanks, guys. We'll see you another time. Okay, bye. Thanks, guys. Okay.